Um, we talk, I talked this morning about temptation, and James talks about that between verses 12 and 15, about enduring temptation, the fact that we're all going to have to suffer, uh, deal with the idea of the temptation to do wrong. Everybody will. Okay, there's nobody that is exempt from that. We all face it. We all have to learn to deal with it. It comes to us through our lust. But we're going to talk a little bit beyond that tonight, and we're going to go down to verse 16 through 18. That's going to be the real focus this evening. And uh, James says in James chapter 1, verse 16 through 18, Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, of his own will begat he us with the word of God, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his create creatures. And we're going to stop there. I'll talk to you about those verses. Let's pray, though. Heavenly Father, we just want to come to you tonight and give you the honor and praise that you deserve as God, he who is great and wonderful, as we've looked at over the past few months, the character of you, God, being eternal, holy, righteous, good, just. You are altogether lovely, as the Bible says. And tonight, as we look a little bit more about an idea that James puts forth here, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to understand the Scripture, but not so much to know what it says, but so that we can apply it to our lives in a way that helps us live more for you what you want us to be, to do more for you what you want us to do, and to praise you and for give you all the honor and glory for it, because if it wasn't for your word, we wouldn't be able to. So thank you so much for your word. We ask your blessing on the time we have as we look at it tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. And uh, so James talks about temptations. He talks about the fact we're going to deal with temptations. And then the very next verse here, in verse number 16, he says, Do not err. My beloved brethren. Now the word err here, okay, when we think of erring, we think of making a mistake, right? Think of making a mistake or doing something wrong or, or being mistaken about something. And that's true in, that con in, in, the, in, the, in the concept of erring, but it means a little bit more than that. It means to make a mistake by being deceived about something. That's what it means in the Greek language. It means to be deceived to the point of wandering. Have you ever been tricked in something or lied to about something or deceived about something and it left you wondering for a little bit of a while? I, 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 I said not too long ago I like maps and I used to be a map person. Every time I went somewhere I had a map with me and I would print them off the internet. Um, before I had an atlas, I would print them off the internet. But one of the things I found out is those maps aren't always accurate, right? So you get to going down the street and you expect it to go in a certain direction. And you get there and it doesn't. Or it's not there completely. Uh, when I got my first GPS device, the global positioning device that has the map mm -hmm. in it. It tells you where you're going. Um, somebody had sent me one. A friend of mine had sent me one because we were going to visit them and he didn't want me to get lost. But it was so out of date. They had built a new freeway, they redirected the freeway, and as I was driving, uh, the GPS kept telling me I was driving through a field, but it was a road that had been <laughs> built, you know, and such. So, so maps aren't always accurate, but when something is mistaken or something, we get, we get the wrong impression about something, it can leave us wandering, looking for the right direction to go. That's as true about maps as it is about life. Somebody can tell us something that's not true, and it leaves us wandering, trying to figure out what the right direction is to go in life. And so what James is saying here is he wants us to not be deceived to the point that we are just looking around trying to, and not having a full concept of what it is about life that we're supposed to have. We're wasting our time because we're misguided or we're misreading what it is about life. We can be deceived by others. We can deceive ourselves. Sometimes we only see what we truly want to see about life. You familiar with the story of the emperor's new clothes? The emperor's new clothes. The emperor had all the money in the world, that he had, and he had all the clothes he ever wanted, and he, he was bored with all of his clothes because they all, to him, looked the same. So he hired two men to come and 
saying, who said that they could sew him a, a, a set of clothes that were unlike any other clothes in the world, and he paid them a lot of money, and they said the clothes had the distinctive uh, qualification that if you're stupid or if you're unfit at your job, you can't see the clothing at all. And the emperor thought, ooh, wow, i got to have these clothes. They sound so interesting. But what they did is they tricked him, and they didn't make any clothes at all. It was all a farce. You know the story, right? Never heard that? So the emperor so, so the emperor wanted to see his clothes, and he went after they finished, and he looked, and he didn't see anything. And the emperor thought, ooh, am I stupid? <laughs> or am I unfit as the emperor in my kingdom? So instead of admitting the fact that he didn't see the clothes, he said, oh, they look lovely. You know? <laughs> They're beautiful clothes. And they hadn't made anything at all. They'd just taken the money and deceived the emperor into thinking there was something there. And because he wanted to believe he saw something that wasn't there. So the emperor said, I want to have a parade. He said, I want to wear my new set of clothes out in my new parade, in this fancy parade, and get the whole kingdom together. So the kingdom lined the streets to see the emperor walk down in his underwear because he wasn't wearing <laughs> anything else. But nobody would say anything because nobody wanted to admit that they couldn't see the clothes that weren't there because they didn't want to be seen as stupid or foolish or unfit for their job. And so... They went along with the deception until one little child in their innocence said, look, mommy, emperor's got no clothes on. Yeah. It was at that moment that the emperor had to come to the realization that he had been deceived. So James says to us, he says to us, listen, so I don't want you to be mistaken, but I don't want you to wander from being tricked or deceived about certain things in life. So get the right perspective, get the right ideas, because I want you to know God. Like we ought to know God. So, um, so for example, I'll give you an example. I've talked with people, and I remember when I was a teenager, probably or close to 20 years ago now, talking with somebody about church and asking them why they didn't go to church, and they told me the reason they didn't go to church was because the last time they went to church, their house burned down. House caught on fire while they were at church, it burned down, and they didn't understand why God would let that happen while they were at church. Now, listen, I don't know why God would allow that to enter our lives. We know that everything that happens, God allows. Everything. Either He allows it or He makes it happen. It's one of those two. And I don't know why God allows certain things. But when we have a, the wrong picture, when we start getting the wrong idea about God, we wander in this life. People will say, why doesn't God stop oppression, violence, and all the things that happen in the world that are evil and wicked? Why doesn't God uh, step in and stop these things? And those things come from the wrong perspective or the deception about God and the world. God is good. The world is not because it's filled with people who are sinners. So when things happen, it is not God's fault when we do things ourselves. When Cain killed his brother Abel, that was Cain's fault. That was not God's fault. But when we have the misconceptions and we have the deceptions, we wander from reality and we begin to wander from the Lord Job, who is a perfect example of patience in the Bible, to the point that Jesus himself said, consider the patience of Job, Jesus said, and we consider what Job went through, but even Job struggled. He did. Even Job's friends struggled. Job's friends said to Job, Job, if you're, if you're suffering, you must have done something wrong because God only punishes bad people. And Job said, no, 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 I haven't done anything wrong, and if I have, then I, God has to come tell me about it. In fact, he said, the Almighty should write me a book and let me read it so that I can walk through life understanding what he has to say. God, you owe me an explanation. And then one man stood up by the name of Elihu and said, the Almighty isn't going to do anything wrong. The Almighty cannot be understood by men. And when Job began to understand that God didn't owe Job an explanation, the Bible says that God, Job repented repented and he turned back to God. His perception was fixed and then God was able to turn Job's trials 
for something that was good. So, so John, John, J James talks to us here, he says, don't err. He says, don't be led astray by deceptions about God and about the world. So he gives us a few things. Let's look at those tonight and then we'll be done. And we'll make it somewhat brief this evening, I think. So he says, here's some things to understand about God and not be deceived about. So number one, understand, I mentioned this a little bit this morning, the nature of temptation. If we go back a few verses to verse 13, of chapter 1, James says, Let no man say when he is tempted that I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is, draw, is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So James says, listen, one of the areas that we might get mistaken about that would cause us to wander from God, where we get confused or deceived about, is the source or the nature of temptations. Temptations don't come from God. The temptation to do wrong, that's not from God. It's not. I've heard people say, well, if God really didn't want man to sin, why did God make the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Well, God made the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to give man the choice. But God was not the cause of the sin. God didn't tempt Adam and Eve. Satan did. But people get the wrong impression about God and they get these deceptions about God that sin is a result of God and that it's God's fault. And then they wander because they have the wrong idea about God. When Jesus was, on the, when Jesus was going to be crucified and uh, Pilate said, I can let you go. And Jesus says, no, 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 you can't. You can only do what God gives you the power to do. He said, and if anybody's sinning then or anybody's doing wrong, then God's doing wrong. But we know God doesn't do wrong. We know that. We know that. We can't lay the blame of people at the feet of Christ, but we also cannot lay the blame of temptation at the, at, the feet of, at the feet of God. Notice it says in verse 13, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Notice it says, God cannot be tempted with evil. God cannot be tempted or tested or tried the same way we can. The temptation to do evil is a drawing away from God, but God, just as he cannot tempt us or draw us away from him, we cannot tempt God either. We can't. The Jews tried to, but it didn't work. The Israelites did. In fact, the Bible says in the book of Psalms that when Israel was in the wilderness, they tested God. They put him to the test. They said, God, you can give us bread. Can you give us meat? God said, sure, I can give you meat. He said, I'll give you so much meat, it comes out your nose. How's that for meat? <laughs> the Bible says God sent quails, and they had quails. And they said, God, you brought us out in the wilderness. Are you going to kill us out here? How about some water? The Bible says Moses smote the rock with his rod, and water gushed out. And people were filled with water. But those that tempted God, those that put God to the test, those that would say, basically, God will only believe you if you do this, didn't believe God. And many of them perished in the wilderness, in wandering in the wilderness, because they had the wrong picture of who God was. They erred or they were deceived about God, and they tried to tempt God, but we can't tempt God. We can't put God on trial. We can't do that. Some of us, some people have this idea of God, that God is is guilty and we he needs to prove himself they'll say things like if god is real then he needs to prove it by doing this you ever heard somebody say that mm -hmm. that's the wrong idea that's what james is talking about he says you're making a mistake he said that mistake is causing you to wander from who god is because in your mind god has to prove himself to you but you know what god doesn't have to prove himself to anybody he's god he created everything there is. If there's any proof of God, look around. It's all around us in the beauty of what it is he's created. But as we tempt God, as we test God, or think that we can test God, we are then wandering in the wilderness. Until we take God off trial and realize that God is good and God always does good. When we come to that realization... We live a much more peaceful life. It's a good day in our lives when we stop acting as though God is guilty and God is the one who has the problem, because God does not. Next thing that, jo that James tells us here, he says, first of all, he says, the nature of temptation is something we can be drawn away about, we can be er error over, we can make mistake about or be deceived about. He said, not only that, 
He said, there's also the fact of tempting God that we can be deceived about. Then he says, in verse number 17, he says, well, let's read verse 16 and 17. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom, it, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. The next thing that James says we have to understand or be wary of is this idea of gifts from God. Gifts from God. I am so glad that God gives us good things, aren't you? <laughs> God is so good to us. He's so wonderfully good. In a world where evil reigns and in a world oftentimes where injustice takes place and in a world where sin is put on the front page of the newspaper and, and violence and, and immorality, I am so glad we have a good God. And I'm so glad that we have a good God who gives us good things. Every good and perfect gift is from above. There is nothing that God gives us that is not good. Now, do we receive evil in this life? Absolutely. Does that come from God? Not at all. Not at all. I go back to the illustration of Job. And I think about that, you know, Poor, I, I think poor Job, you know, he lost so much. He did. And he lost his, his family, or his kids, he lost his wealth, he lost his health for a while. His wife was just told him, why don't curse God and die? And I don't know if she was being malicious. She might have been being pitiful, saying, Job, everything's so pitiful, why don't you just end the misery? That, that may be her motivation, I don't know. What would it be like, I mean, in, in your life if you saw your... Somebody going through that now, maybe it was malicious. Maybe she was just saying, Job, why don't you just kill yourself? I don't know, but she was, you know, he lost everything. But you know, I think about that, and I'm reminded of the fact that through it all, God remained faithful. When Job questioned him, God still remained faithful. When Job, Job's patience, I mean, it lasted, he did. He endured the trials, he did. But he said, you know, I need somebody to explain this to me. I need so much. And God came to Job and God reminded Job of his power and strength and might and what he does and how big he is. And then Job realized, I, I really don't need somebody to explain it. I just need to trust God. But God remained faithful to Job. And God remains faithful to us when we don't understand too. And when we wander, when we, when we don't understand what God is doing... But, you know, Job had so much evil come into his life, but God didn't do that. Satan did. Satan came to God. God said, have you seen, have you seen Job? And, and Satan said, well, yeah, but you protected him. Let me touch his life. And God said, okay, I'll let you touch it, but only so much, you know. And Satan is the one that stepped in and brought the evil. But once the trial was over, God brought back the good. Because when God's moving in our life, it moves for good. Now, I've said, I, I mentioned this when I was talking about the goodness of God. And I think it's important that we separate the idea of good and beneficial. Because sometimes we think things are only good if I see the benefit right now. Well, there's some things that are good in our life that we're not going to understand are really good for a long time. Right. Sometimes something comes into our life we think is not so good. Maybe a year, two years, three years, five yeah. years down the road, we might realize that was the best thing that ever happened. Yep. Because God loves us and he wants the best for us. So what God brings into our life is good and sometimes we don't recognize that it is good, but it is. If it comes from God, we can guarantee it's good. The way he talks about the relationship here in verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. I love the fact that God refers to us to, him, to our relationship with him as the father-child relationship. Because we understand that a father, in a perfect father, will want what is best for his child. Maybe in life we haven't had the father who always wanted what was best for us. But Jesus even said to the people there, he said, if a, if a father, if a son asked his father for, a, for bread, is he going to give him a stone? I mean, would he? Wouldn't think so. He said, if, a, if you'd ask for a fish, would he give him a serpent? I don't think so. He said, so if you know how to give good gifts to your children, 
how much more does God know how to give good gifts to us? Because he is our mm -hmm. perfect father. I was speaking with someone who said that they had a hard time sometimes with that concept of a father because their father had been so hard on them growing up. But what helped them understand God and the father relationship was that God is the perfect father. He always does what's right. He always does what's good. And if it comes from God, we can guarantee that it is good. Now, that doesn't mean it's what we want all the time. As a child, I might want ice cream. And God says, I need the broccoli. <laughs> I want, I want, I want uh, chips and God wants to give me Brussels sprouts. <laughs> I, I, I didn't like Brussels sprouts growing up. I've come to like them a little bit now. <laughs> uh, but, but you know God knows exactly what is best for me. And God will always bring in that which is good in my life. And that's one area where I must not make a mistake. I must not be deceived. I must not err. God is the father of light and in him is no darkness and no shadow of turning at all. And the last thing James tells us we must not make a mistake about or must not err about. He says, realize the nature of temptation. Realize that God does not tempt us and God cannot be tempted by us. Realize that we receive good at the hand of the Father. Every good gift is from above. Okay, and last, look what he says in verse 18. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And what he's talking about here is he's talking about salvation. The word begat means to birth or give birth to. So of his will, that is of God's will, he gave birth to us with the word of truth. That is the word of God. That we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. He's talking about the new birth of salvation. Just like Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3 that a person had to be born again to go to heaven. Except a man be born again, cannot see the kingdom of God. Except someone is born of water and of spirit, meaning we have to have a physical birth and a spiritual birth. He said, uh, he said that which is born of flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And we must not be mistaken or deceived about salvation and what salvation is and how we're saved. Because when we're deceived about our salvation, we can spend our whole life wandering from God and not even realize it. You know, there are some folks, as sad as it is, who have grown up with a religion but have never known Jesus. And they've wandered their entire life believing something that may have been mistaken because they don't know Christ. And that's what he's talking to Nicodemus about. He said, you're a ruler or you're a teacher of the Jews. You're a Pharisee and a religious leader. Don't you know these things, he said. Nicodemus was a religious man who did not know what God wanted for salvation, which was to be born again. The Bible says here that he begat us. Okay, the word begat again means to give birth to. The idea is that God gave the life to us. In order for a person to be saved, he must be born again. And we cannot will it. It has to be of God. That doesn't mean we don't play a part. I'll explain that in a moment. But we can't just say, okay, I want to be saved, God, and that's it. There's something there. And I'm going to give you three things just real quickly on this salvation idea. They're so important, and I want to make it as clear as I can tonight about salvation and what salvation means. I will do my best what the Bible teaches about salvation. The first thing we have to understand is we must realize our need. Realize our need. Okay? Realize our need of salvation. Uh, Paul spells it out very clearly in the book of Romans. And he talks about our need of salvation when he says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What he's saying in that passage of scripture very simply is this, that when it comes to our nature, we have fallen short of what God requires of us. God, when he made Adam and Eve, they were perfect. 
Though they were innocent, they had no knowledge of good and evil. But because they deliberately chose to sin, they brought into that world a concept of both good and evil, and then the ability or the will to choose either one. But that fallen nature of man chooses evil oftentimes. Every one of us has deliberately chosen to violate God's law and do wrong. Everybody has. There's not one person in the world who could stand up and truthfully say that they have never sinned. In fact, 1 John chapter 1 tells us if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 10 tell us that. So if we say, I'm not sinned, or we say, I have no sin, we're contradicting what God says, which is we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's our need. Our need is the fact that we have all come under the condemnation of God because of our sin. Back up in James chapter 1 and verse uh, number 15, he explains it. Uh, 14 and 15, it says, Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And that's the, that's the need we have. We've all been tempted, haven't we? We've all fallen short, haven't we? Yes, we have. Very real way we've all Violating God's laws, we've all come short of God's perfection. So what Jesus says is we've got to be born again. That's the need. That's the need. Because guess what happens? Guess what happens? Guess what happens? A person who's a sinner, you know what happens if they get baptized? They're still a sinner. People sin before they're baptized. People sin after they're baptized. A person who's a sinner can join the church, and guess what? They're a sinner before they join the church, they're a sinner after they join the church. We're all sinners. A person can do good in their life and do right a lot of the time, but guess what? We're sinners before we do right, we're sinners after we do We're just, we're sinners, that's our nature. So what Christ is telling us is we need a new nature. Now, are we going to be a sinner after we're saved? Yes, we are, but the difference is we're born of the Spirit. The Spirit does dwell in us. Why is it we all die? Because we're all sinners. Even Christians die, right? Because they're sinners. But because of the new nature, that new birth of the Spirit, even though we die, Jesus said, He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Why? Because there's a new nature. That's why. But if I die without that new nature, then I'm under the wrath and condemnation of God. And, uh, and I will not see that life. Jesus said, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life. There's no life there. So we need to realize the need. Second, we need to realize the Savior. Okay? Realize the need. So how, what is salvation? We've got to realize the need. I'm a sinner, and I will always be that way. But there's hope in the fact that there's a Savior who, through, through whom I can experience the new birth. The Savior, Jesus Christ, came to the earth to deliver us from that sin. He came as the sacrifice once for all, born of a virgin, and lived 33 sinless years on the earth, and afterwards took on himself my sin on the cross, and your sin on the cross, and the sin of the world on the cross of Calvary. Jesus Christ was the substitute. Just like in the Old Testament, every time they sin, what did they have to bring to that temple? They had to bring a lamb or a goat or a cow or a turtle dove, depending on what God told them. And they had to bring that animal. Would that animal have to be killed? Why did the animal have to die? Did the animal do any wrong? No. The animal sin? No. Did the animal deserve death? The animal was a picture of the fact that in order for my sin to be cleansed, something that hadn't sinned and something that wasn't sinful and something that wasn't guilty had to die in my place. That's what the picture was. 
And that was Jesus. Jesus came to this earth and he was not a sinner. He was God in the flesh. He was not sinful. He did not uh, succumb to any temptation. He was t in every way tested like we are, yet without sin. So when he died, he wasn't dying a deserved death. He was dying a substitute of death. Not deserving sin in death, but substituting for my sin. Just like that sacrifice in the Old Testament that was brought to the temple and killed, sacrificed in the place of someone else. Jesus was sacrificed in the place of me. The difference, though, was that after three days, Jesus came back. <laughs> None of the animals did that. Yeah. But Jesus did. Because he had power over death and he had power over hell. He had power over everything. So he came back and was risen again after three days. But we have to realize our need. We are sinners. We need somebody to save us. And when we need to realize the Savior, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth and died for us. And the last part of the salvation is we need to repent and trust him by faith. Acts puts it this way. Repentance toward God in faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. To repent means to turn. And what we're called to do is we're called to turn to God. We have no ability to save ourselves, none whatsoever. There's no amount of good we can do that will erase the record of our bad. There's no amount of righteous deeds we can do that can eliminate the sins of our past. There is nothing we can do to stop the judgment of God other than to turn to God in faith. And trust in Christ as our Savior, fully relying on Him, taking Him as our Savior. But James tells us in this passage of Scripture, those are the things we really need to be careful. We don't make a mistake about. Because if we're deceived, or if we're drawn away, or pulled aside, or we err, we'll spend our life sometimes wandering, not understanding God and who He is. We, if we get the idea that the, the bad in this world is God's fault, that somehow temptation and sin is because of God, we have the wrong idea about God completely. And people wander their whole lives thinking that, never coming to God because they have the wrong idea of God. If we have the wrong idea about what God does and the fact that what God does is good, we'll wander from the Lord. I know good Christian people who have had something come into their life. And rather than trust that God is still working, like the Bible says, all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, their heart becomes hard because of something that God allows. And rather than trusting God, they turn and wander because they have the wrong idea about what's God doing. God's good, how can you let that happen? Well, God's good. God's always good. And what God does is good. What we do isn't always good. What God does is. We have to understand there's a difference between what we do and what God does. And then if we get the wrong idea of salvation, if we don't understand that we're sinners in need of a Savior, and we don't turn to God and trust Him by faith, we will wander our whole life. And if we die in that state, the Bible says we will never see that eternal life from God. My brethren, he says here, my beloved brethren, those whom I love do not err. And I want to just give us some encouragement today to have a proper picture of God and what he's doing in our lives. So let's go to him in prayer, and then we'll sing a closing song tonight. Father, thank you so much again for the word of God and how it sets our perspective properly. And because of your word, because of what you tell us about yourself, we get a true picture of who you are. And Lord, I just ask that you would help us to trust what your word says about you and trust, Father, that what you are doing, you are doing well and you're doing right. Father, we do look forward to the day when the veil is torn back and we can see you and we can see all that you've done and the ways that you've moved and the things that you've brought into our lives and the things that you've allowed into our lives so that we may worship you and say that you have done all things well. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us and help us to constantly abide in it, we ask in Christ's name. Amen.